Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve, Steve Palmer. Steve Palmer was the first person who has ever taught me anything about perception. Um, I didn't know anything before I started at Berkeley and I learned everything from him. Um, I've been here for many, many years and one of the most common questions that people come to me with is, you're a psychologist, don't you guys know what kind of colors people like or dislike, what kind of color combinations, uh, what arrangements of objects are good for the page or bad for the page? And the truth is that very few psychologists study that, those, those kinds of topics because, um, well, I don't know why. Partly because most of us perceive them as boring and partly because there's no money in it. Um, so Steve is one of the few who, um, who does. Uh, he's probably most famous for his work in vision science and a very famous textbook called From Photons to Phenomenology. And um, I don't know what else to say. And he's a professor at UC Berkeley and he's teaching classes in perception, if anybody is interested. With that, I'll let him talk. So it's a pleasure to be here. Wow, everything just works. It's great. You know, it doesn't happen this way in universities. Uh, so I want to tell you um, about the research. I've been doing this research for about a year, a year and a half now. Um, and it's a topic, it's aesthetic science. I think there is or can be a science of aesthetics. There isn't really one, but I think there can be. Um, and to some degree, I'm trying to get people interested in, in doing this sort of thing. Uh, and I'm going to talk about essentially three different research problems or related research problems, actually, uh, one of which is uh, uh, people's perceptions of color and color combinations in particular. Uh, another is about people's preferences for spatial arrangements of objects in a uh, side of a rectangular frame. And the third one is actually about the structure of a rectangular frame itself. Some sort of, uh, these qu questions are all sort of, I think of as being sort of basic science questions that you would ask if you were, if there were such a thing as a science of aesthetics. Um, so I will introduce uh, you to those strands of research together with a, a, a brief inter introduction, which is uh, supposed to be motivating. Uh, because when you talk to university audiences about this kind of stuff, there isn't anybody who's already motivated to study aesthetics. Nobody does it. So the first thing that you want to do uh, is find out what it is that you're trying to study. So what is aesthetics? Uh, you go to the dictionary, and it doesn't really help very much. You get these, uh, this long gobbledygook-like thing with uh, the ugly, the sublime, the comic, et cetera. That's the one that kills me. As you go into your dictionary and you find et cetera, you know you've, uh, you're not done. The second, the second definition is a little bit cleaner. It's right, the study of the mind and emotions in relation to the sense of beauty. That sounds great, neat, neat and tidy. But of course, then you go and look up beauty, and then the et cetera start appearing again shape, color, sound, et cetera, a meaningful design or pattern, or something else, <laughs> right? So um, I think there's a fundamental reason why uh, you don't find good dictionary definitions uh, of this, and that is because it's not possible uh, any more than it's possible to give a dictionary definition of what redness or pain or anything like that is, and that's because Basically, aesthetic is a, a phenomenological concept. It's something about our experience, and you can't define it to somebody who doesn't have those experiences. It's really, we can try to point to it using words, um, but as far as actually getting a definition from the words, it's, it's very difficult. So what I'm going to mean, I don't have a good definition of aesthetics, but I think we all know what it means. It's this analysis of the experiential dimension that's anchored on one end by, ah, oh, wow, yeah, that's great, it works, and anchored at the other end by, yuck, that's awful. So, um, this is the motivational part to try to get people to believe that aesthetics is very an important part of almost everybody's mental lives. Uh, it's most obviously related to our perception and uh, appreciation of the fine arts. So painting, photography, these are photographs actually by the famous uh, black and white photographer, me. One of the reasons I got into this stuff is because, in fact, I'm a photographer. And I want to understand why it is I like the pictures I like, why I take the pictures I take, um, and how those things might be understood in a scientific way. 
sculpture, of course, over the ages, and uh, architecture, not exactly a fine art, but one where everybody takes it for granted that aesthetics is part of uh, what makes great architecture great. But there's lots of other places where aesthetics is important in, in what we do, how we spend money, uh, what we, where we like to spend our time. We go to see movies when uh, you know, they're particularly aesthetically appealing uh, movies. Uh, we pick out our clothes because we think that they are aesthetically appealing, at least on us. Um, and uh, we spend enormous amounts of money uh, trying to find things that will produce aesthetically appealing uh, presentations to the world. Um, in uh, industrial design, there are certain designs that are generally acknowledged to be particularly uh, appealing aesthetically. Even where we go on vacations is very often driven by just how beautiful it is. Um, and for you guys, this is a new page in the <laughs> in the presentation, website design. Actually, it was very difficult for me to find what I considered to be aesthetically appealing website designs. Um, I looked at hundreds of them. I even went to websites. You know, I did a Google search on uh, award-winning websites. Most of them are very ugly. They flash a lot, and they have you know, neat kind of uh, graphic uh, um, dynamic effects and things, but they aren't really aesthetically appealing. Uh, I find that most of the ones are, in fact, websites that are related to work that, that is uh, of artists or art-related uh, objects. But that's not all, of course. Um, maybe most <laughs> important of all, uh, how we spend our time looking around the world, what we fixate on, what we track, and so forth, uh, is largely determined by aesthetics. Now, I want to warn you that I don't mean that aesthetics is the same thing as art. In fact, um, it turns out that an awful lot of the people, things that people find aesthetically appealing, most of which I've, or many of which I've just alluded to, uh, are in fact not art. I mean, art is restricted to things that are man-made and, and usually that are intentionally uh, designed and created to be art, but there's all sorts of things to which we have positive aesthetic uh, experiences that are not art. Um, so supposing that you believe that aesthetics is an interesting and important thing to try to understand, is it possible that we can come to a scientific understanding of it? Uh, well, a lot of people, scientists in particular, would think not because, in fact, uh, science is objective and aesthetics is subjective. Uh, science is lawful. Aesthetics is whimsical. Science is clear cut. Uh, aesthetics is fuzzy. I don't have that on the slide. but And we have all of these sort of aphorisms, like there's no accounting for taste, beauty's in the mind of the beholder, all of which seems to imply that there's no such thing or there can't be any such thing as a science of aesthetics. But I want to convince you that that's not the case. And um, when I talk about taking an approach to aesthetics, there's really uh, two basic different ways you can do it. Uh, a sort of prescriptive approach, which is the one you usually find where uh, an art critic or um, an art theorist says what it is that you should like. For example, uh, when we get to the section about color, I'll talk about you know, some of the ideas where Essentially, the uh, color theorists have said what it is that people should find pleasing uh, rather than what they actually do find pleasing. Uh, and the alternative being an, an empirical approach, uh, which is what we do. We try to find out with um, everyday people, that is to say, you know, by and large uh, undergraduates at Berkeley, uh, what they like aesthetically when you say, you know, tell us which one of these things you like better. There's actually a third uh, approach that has, um, has uh, become popular recently called neuroaesthetics. How many people have ever heard of neuroaesthetics? OK, then I won't say anything about it. Not enough of you have. It's not worth paying much attention to. Um, so I'm going to tell you, first of all, about the spatial composition uh, a pro a project. These are, this is my lab. And the people um, uh, working on this are primarily jo Jonathan Gardner and myself. Um, the approach we take is a psychophysical approach. Um, we show people a pair of pictures like these two and say, which one do you like better aesthetically? OK, so how many people prefer the one on the left? Raise your hands. 
How many people prefer the one on the right? Only a couple. OK, now there's a reason for that, OK? And what we're trying to find out is why that is, all right? So actually, as simple as this comparison is, it's actually too complicated for our experiments because I've not only changed the position of uh, Whistler's mother, but also the photograph and her position relative to the, to the uh, wall behind her has changed and so forth. So we do these experiments using what's called a two alternative force choice task in which we show them a pair of pictures that contain just one object and a ground line. And in fact, uh, this should disabuse you of the idea that I'm studying anything that's remotely connected to art, per se, because none of these pictures that you're going to see are anything close to art. Nevertheless, people have aesthetic preferences. They can tell you which one they like better. We have never had a single subject that said, what do you mean, which one do I like better? <laughs> Hasn't happened. Um, so they do it, and they do it relatively quickly and easily. They have a gut level reaction to these sorts of things. And uh, we have them press the left key if they like the left one better, and the right key if they like the right one better. So the first experiment, we actually uh, have this single object at one of seven different positions and one of two different orientations, that is, facing left or facing right. And we give them uh, all possible pairs of, of uh, pictures containing the same object. So we're interested in spatial composition. We're not interested in people's preferences for content. So you might like teapots better than you like rocking horses. That's not something we want to study. So in our experiments, teapots are always compared with pictures of teapots. All right. And uh, I should say the uh, objects that we use were defined by uh, in this experiment, we had two objects at each different aspect ratio, from sort of tall, skinny things to sort of short, fat things, because we thought that was going to matter. It mattered a little bit, but not very much, so I'm not going to tell you um, about it in the interest of time. So in this object, in this experiment, we had the same object compared with itself. Either the two objects, uh, two pictures were facing in the same direction as they are going across the rows, or they could be in the same position and facing in opposite directions. Um, and we basically had people do all possible comparisons. So the one on the left was compared with all of the ones to the right of it. Um, uh, those are the so-called same facing comparisons. And we also had the comparisons where they were in the same position and facing in the opposite direction. And in each case, we asked people, which one do you like better? So if we look at all the, if we look at the grand average over these data, we're looking here, we're plotting the percentage of the time that any given, um, this is collapsed over those different objects, the percentage of the time where the um, image with the, uh, uh, where the objects are presented on the left most position, say, is how often is it chosen compared with all of the other ones? We're looking to the grand average over that, OK? And what we find is this very regular curve with a maximum in the center. We call this the center bias, um, where people like to see the object, by and large, in the center of the frame. But this, of course, is averaging over both the left facing and the right facing uh, conditions. So let's look at those data. Here we have now the green, uh, sorry, the blue. <laughs> the blue ones are the left facing objects, and the red ones are the right facing objects. And what you find is that for the right facing objects, there's still a center bias. People like it to be in the center. But if it's off to the left, they like it just as well. If it's facing inward, we call this the inward bias, because this particular interaction here, where the rightward facing ones are preferred on the left side of the screen and the left facing ones are preferred on the right uh, side of the screen, uh, is a, a bias towards wanting to see these objects facing inward rather than facing outward. And it's a very robust effect. Um, we can also see this in the opposite facing conditions. So here we've got a pair of pictures in which the object is in the same position. They have to pick between one of these two and say which one they like better. And there's a very strong bias, which is the one uh, there. There's a very strong bias toward uh, picking the one that is facing inward and to the right. But of course, it changes as you go across the, uh, across the screen so that by the time you get to the rightmost position, people much prefer the one that's facing to the left. Um, yeah? What is the total number of uh, subjects and total number of weightages for these experiments? 
total number of subjects, it's something on the order of between 10 and 15. These are very easy effects to get. You get them very quickly. How many? Uh, well, you can probably figure it out if you, it's the combinations of all possible pairs of those things that I showed you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is averaged over the objects in the yeah. set? The objects. I know how to tell the difference between the two ends of a dog, but what about a teapot? Well, there's certainly, I'd say, a front end of the teapot. I think if you asked 100 people which end was the front end of a teapot, it would be 100 to 0. Uh, it's the part where the, where the liquid comes out. Now, it's interesting, actually, uh, that you actually handle the other part. And um, I'll mention in a minute, when we, when we ask people to take uh, photographs of objects, that you might expect, I haven't gotten to this yet, but there's also the third bias that we find is a rightward bias. And sometimes it's big and sometimes it's little. I think that it's an individual difference of some sort, maybe having to do with handedness or hemispheric lateralization. Um, here you can see it right there at the center position. There's a slight tendency to prefer the one that's, that's facing to the right. Um, but it's not very strong. Uh, in the photographic experiment, it's actually quite strong. Yeah. Yeah, we are trying to sort out. Let me say, first of all, about this rightward bias. I don't know why. Everybody like focuses in on the rightward bias. Wow. It's really small. It's, it, it's very variable. You find it sometimes. You don't find it other times. In this experiment, it's not there with you know, this number of subjects. Uh, there have been. It's the one thing about sort of spatial composition that has been studied a fair amount before the things that we've done. Um, they typically take pictures or famous paintings or whatever and show them in re mirror reversed. And, and you find differences. And they do seem to be related to handedness. And they do seem to re be related also to the direction in which uh, your language reads. Uh, there are those kinds of things. We only have 10 or 15 subjects. We can't study those things. And actually, I'm not particularly interested in, in, in studying those things, like I said. Compared to these other effects, it's tiny. Yeah. Uh, they, they just don't care. Yeah. Uh, well, if we do, we usually throw them out. <laughs> uh, there aren't many. Um, I don't think we ever have in the spatial stuff. We've had in the color thing. We've had a couple of subjects who will sometimes seem not to care about anything, and they're not colorblind, but they just seem not to care. Very unusual. Yeah. How many subjects chosen? Uh, for these experiments, they're just. Undergraduates at Berkeley who are taking some sort of a introductory psychology class and are required to take a certain number of hours to do a certain number of hours of experiments. In the color experiments, uh, they're paid subjects, and we get them from a um, some ca a campus uh, service that finds subjects. So that includes older uh, adults and people from sort of lots of different walks of life. But, but the first two sets of uh, projects that I'm going to talk about, they're uh, Berkeley undergraduates. And the reasonable mix of the majors or something like that? Uh, well, you know, they're probably, they're mainly freshmen and sophomores, so a lot of them haven't declared yet. There's a pretty wide uh, group that takes introductory psychology. But of course, there's probably more people who are going to be psychologists or social scientists than there are people who are going to be physicists and mathematicians. Yeah? Were uh, In this experiment, no. But, but uh, I'll get to that. Uh, what, you, what you get is a, is a function that just shows the center bias. And it's, it's more sharply peaked than what I showed you before is the center bias. That's because we only got it this way by averaging it over it. In order to squeeze this into an hour, which I'm probably not going to make anyway, I've had to leave out experiments like that, uh, that particular one. Um, OK, so we talked about the right-facing bias. So this is a very well-controlled experiment. And the question we wanted to ask next was, well, does it show up if we actually give people uh, more choice? We do the open-ended uh, task, which is give people a camera and ask them to take um, pictures. And we asked them to take pictures of three everyday objects, a teapot, a tape dispenser, and a steam iron. Okay, And um, 
We put it on a turntable and we let them turn uh, the object's orientation any way they wanted to. And for the first picture that they took, we said, take the most aesthetically pleasing picture you can. Anything you want to, doesn't matter. Um, and then after that, after they'd done that for each of the, um, these three objects, then we asked them to take some more constrained photographs. We said, okay, take the most aesthetically pleasing picture you can, but the object has to face to the right of center. It doesn't have to face directly to the right. It could be slanted, but just right-ish or left-ish. Okay? So when you look at what we did in this case was we actually uh, measured the center, the position of the center of the object within the frame when people took these um, photographs. And then we constructed a uh, histogram, essentially, of where the center of that object was. We had seven equal size positional bins and just looked at the number of pictures within which uh, the center fell in, those, uh, in that position. And here we see our old friend, this is the center bias. Now, in this case, there was a big rightward bias that when, in that first picture, when people could do anything they wanted to, they actually had the object facing right 80% of the time. And this actually includes um, a, both the uh, steam iron and a teapot where you would typically use your right hand. It would actually just frequency-wise, if most people are right-handed, it would tend to be facing left most of the time that you see it. And yet, um, there, in this case, there seems to be a strong rightward facing bias. But like I said, there are other experiments in which it doesn't even show up. Um, if we look at the constrained cases where people are told to make it face right or to face, face left, we find the same inward bias that we found before. They like to see the right facing objects be on the left side of the screen and the left facing objects be on the right side of the screen. So um, if we go back to the task that I started with, this two alternative force choice, and we want to uh, you know, move up to a more complex situation that's got like two objects in the same frame, um, one of the problems that you run into is this kind of combinatorial explosion, which is if uh, you independently have these two objects in, say, just seven different positions, uh, you find out that in order to do all the comparisons, you need 2,500 trials. I understand that this does, big numbers don't bother you guys at Google. Maybe that's why you're called Google, but um, it bothers us a lot because <laughs> you can't get people in there to stay for uh, 2,500 uh, of these trials. So we looked for some other ways where we might get uh, some interesting data, and we developed this slider task where we put in a single object, and then we give them control over the position of the object. They slide the mouse left and right. They can try it any place where they want to. And when they get it where they want to, they just press the button. And then uh, we, again, take the uh, center, the we measure the center of the position of that object. And again, we can do the same kind of thing uh, where we plot these histograms. What's the frequency? And here, these are actually right facing, these are forward facing objects, whoever it was that asked that question. These are symmetrical objects. Um, and when they're symmetrical, you get this very strong bias to have it placed in the center of the frame. And it's very sharply tuned. I'm actually kind of surprised these data came out uh, even more beautifully than the others. If you give them uh, an object where it's facing to the left or facing to the right, you find the inward bias again uh, very strongly. And in this particular experiment, uh, in addition to asking them to put it in the best possible position, we also asked them to put it in the worst possible position. So they did the same thing. They slid it around. And, and what you find is essentially the inverse of the functions you found before, um, that the forward-facing objects, they tend to put it over on the side, but they didn't care which side. Whereas for the right-facing objects and left-facing objects, they put it on the side, but they put the right objects on the right side, so they're facing out of the frame and so forth. The only thing that's kind of unfortunate here is that little blip in the center. And I think that that's probably due to a couple of people who had taken a photography class or an art class, and somebody had told them, you don't put the object in the center of the frame. Right? They knew the rule, so they used the rule. What's the worst possible position? Their teacher had told them. I think that's what it is. Because by and large, uh, people really like it to be in the center of the frame. So the next experiment, we wanted to go see if we could go beyond the two, uh, the one object case 
uh, without the combinatorial pain. Yeah. Somebody thinks that's right. I mean, somebody, somebody, think, somebody who's in a position of, of uh, power or authority, I think, uh, has decided these things and, and says it. And, and it gets uh, codified, in a way. Um, you don't think it makes the composition more interesting? Well, I, I'll, get to, I'll get to that. I mean, I think that what makes compositions interesting is when we start violating these expectations. These biases that I'm studying now are sort of ground background stuff. And in many cases, uh, if you want to do something interesting, you have to violate those expectations in a sort of interesting way. Yeah? I don't know. I mean, you have to find that out. You sort of have to study what it is that our teachers do and, and what stuff already exists. I mean, there's this problem. There's the turtles all the way down problem, which is, you know, the infinite regress that you get into because, well, I like it because that's what I've seen, right? Um, I don't know. You'd have to go back and look at the cave paintings, I guess, and, and uh, try to figure out you know, why they put them where they put them on there in the cave. So what we did in this experiment was we took a configuration of objects, multiple objects, but we treated them as if they were one object. And we picked configurations that um, had a structure. They were always a, a taller object on one side and a gradient, uh, size gradient to the other side where they were smaller, such that it formed this kind of triangle, which then uh, I would say, and if you do look at what people say about these things, that it, it points to the right or it leads the eye to the right rather than to the left. And to the extent that that's the case, and these principles that we were talking about before were general, we should find similar kinds of effects with where people put this uh, configuration of objects. So this experiment was done with exactly the same design, actually, as the first one, where um, the uh, configuration of objects could be in five different positions, and it could be facing left or right or whatever. And what we find is pretty much the same thing that we found before. That is to say, people prefer the, the configuration uh, when it's leading to the right to be on the left side of the screen and, and vice versa. The same sort of inward bias. Uh, one other thing that these data show us is that it's not that the center of mass wants to be near the center because these two configurations would be in the same position because their centers line up. The center of mass is farther away here, and in fact, that's the one that people prefer when you give them the choice between those two. So, um, you know, if we're going to do like what it is that a photographer does when they frame photographs, then we have to worry about things like vertical position as well, and also zoom, right? How big objects are in the frame, and so that's what we've started to do. We haven't gotten terribly far on that. Here's the first experiment that we did with vertical position. And here you have to, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to worry about where the ground line is going to be. And you have to worry about perspective effects on the bowl. You know, do you show the lip of the bowl or whatever? Um, but the important thing is that, uh, or the most obvious thing is that you, the center bias no longer holds here, that people uh, like the position vertically to be uh, much closer to the bottom than they do to the middle or the top. And we don't know why this is yet. Um, I suspect that there are multiple things going on, that this is sort of a combination of a center bias, because you want to have the information uh, you know, toward the center of the frame, combined with some pr principles like something about stability or balance that um, that this picture down here, where the, the solid part of the thing is closer to the bottom, seems more gravitationally stable. It may also be that actually the top of the figure, the top of the object is kind of like the front of the object, that people want the top of the object to be near the center. So we're going to study that, where you can make objects that are tall and thin and stuff like that and find out whether that matters or not. Is there a question? Um, so where are we going with this particular line of research? Like I said, we're um, going to look at uh, how big the object is in the frame uh, and, and whether this depends on the size of the object. I mean, it may be that if it's a really big object that people like it to be fill up more of the frame than if it's a really small object. Um, 
We would like to know what kinds of expertise effects there are. And ideally, we'd like to know, you know where those things come from. Um, but just for starters, we want to find out whether trained artists, people who have been to art school, um, uh, have different preferences from the untutored people that we typically study, and whether there are cultural differences or what kind of cultural differences there are. Um, there's a fair amount of uh, recent stuff that suggested that in Western cultures, we like to focus to zoom in on like one object more, and that in Eastern societies in Japan and China, that they're much more likely to take uh, a more distant perspective, to have more context around it, that this is part of a sort of more general um, uh, cognitive difference between Eastern and Western culture, but they've never really studied it with kind of well-controlled, well-defined uh, uh, images like the ones that we've been using. And another thing I'd like to find out that we're going to head toward is why these biases happen. It could be turtles all the way down. It's just that that's the way people have always done pictures before. But my guess is that it's actually more that the conditions under which people find these things aesthetically pleasing, these biases, are actually aligned with sort of conditions for optimal perception. I mean, if you think about it, that you want the objects to be in the center of the frame or with the most important part of it near the center of the frame, the front of the object, the top of the object. It sounds like there's almost an aesthetic heuristic, which is you know, to try to make the most important in information most easily perceivable in the frame. And there's a hint of this. Uh, somebody actually scooped me on an experiment of my very own. Um, a long time ago, Eleanor Rosh and I did this work on canonical perspective, showing that people perceive objects best from these particular um, hybrid perspectives. We call them canonical perspectives. Um, and recently, uh, Mike Macbeth showed that, in fact, these same perspectives are, in fa are judged to be more aesthetically pleasing uh, than other ones as well. So this is an instance where what seems to be optimal for perception also seems to be aesthetically most pleasing. But I think it's probably a general principle. And to do something interesting, sort of aesthetically interesting, very often what you have to do is violate some of these things, but for some good reason. Because, of course, you know, what these kinds of biases are going to do, I mean, I think you could use these biases to maybe create a, an automated um, photograph cropping program or something like that, where somebody could indicate what the object of interest is, and then you could write a program that would you know, crop it in a reasonably aesthetic way, aesthetically pleasing way. But it's not going to get you great art. Um, and I think a lot of what happens is that uh, you need to violate, violate expectations. So here's a really bad picture uh, for all kinds of reasons. But the one that I want to focus on is that the object is like facing out of the frame. It's not like facing out of the frame. It's actually walking out of the frame, right? And yet it was, uh, at least uh, somebody thought, a, uh, an aesthetically appropriate uh, thing. It was actually the cover of Time magazine. But it works because of the context in which it appeared. It was right after. Bush and his party had lost the election, for all the good that did anybody. Um, and it was trying to uh, indicate sort of his, the Lone Ranger status. Here he is walking, I should maybe say, uh, surging to the right uh, on, on this cover. But the important thing is that the composition, the way in which it's been violated, fits the message that's intended to be conveyed. And this is another thing that actually can be studied and we're going to be studying uh, looking at pe how, how people's aesthetic impressions of things change as a function of, say, what the title of a picture is. Yeah? But this is a totally different composition than what you showed before. Before it was on balance. It wasn't mm -hmm. the amount of things that I thought That's right. But the focus, uh, yeah, and, and uh, they, they weren't going to publish it. I mean, this balances that to a degree and so forth. But I think the important thing is that the picture itself, the first thing that strikes you when you look at this, at this magazine is not the time banner at the top, which is always there, or this thing here. It's the fact that Bush is halfway out of the picture. Right? So there are other things about this design that ameliorate or, or offset um, that uh, compositional aspect. But in fact, I think the crucial thing is that there's a good reason for doing it. 
Okay, the second project I want to tell you about is uh, one in which we're doing work on framing the frame. That is, what's the internal structure? I mean, all, almost all two-dimensional visual graphic art, uh, like websites and, and uh, as well as paintings and so forth, takes place inside of a rectangular frame. And the question is, what is the structure of that frame? And shouldn't that have some influence on where, what spatial compositions we put inside it? So in the first experiment, um, it was a really simple uh, experiment. We simply took a rectangular frame and we put a dot in it. And we told people to make a rating of how well that dot fits at that particular position within the rectangle on a scale from like 1 to 7. I don't remember actually what the, what the scale was. Yeah, scale from 1 to 7. Um, and it was in different positions on different trials. They made a rating of each one. And then we just looked at what the average ratings were as a function of their position. Okay? And so the data are actually very uh, regular. So here we've got the data plotted where the size of the circle here corresponds, the area of the circle corresponds to the, how high the rating was. And there's some color coding as well. And what you find out is that the very best position is, in fact, the one in the very center. That's where the dot fits best. And that there's a gradient outward from that, sort of a monotonic gradient out from that, that the further away from the center you get, the worse the ratings get. But there's also some articulation of the space along these um, global axes of symmetry. If you think about this as being the ratings as being plotted uh, in a third dimension here, there's sort of ridges along there, along those global axes of symmetry. And there are also uh, ridges along these local axes of symmetry, the angle bisectors of the um, rectangle. And we actually did an experiment to find out whether it was actually the angle bisectors or whether it was the global diagonal. And it turns out it's the angle bisectors, not the global diagonal that matters. In fact, you can predict something. I don't have the number here, I think. But you can predict something like 85% of the variance in terms of what these ratings are simply by a linear combination of knowing how far it is from the center, whether it lies along the vertical or the horizontal or one of the uh, local diagonal axes. Oh, maybe I had the data right there, didn't it? Yeah, 82% of the variance you can count for uh, using just the center, distance from the center, and the symmetries. So we also wanted to look at whether there were, um, what, that's just the positional structure within the frame. So we wanted to look now at whether there was directional and orientational structure as well. So we changed our probes from uh, circles to triangles because then they, the probe, uh, the probe uh, shape has only a single axis of symmetry itself. And uh, we looked at a smaller number of positions, but we looked at eight different orientations within the frame. And uh, we made, uh, so people made these ratings. And we were expecting that there would be certain kinds of, of uh, interactions between position and orientation so that along the vertical axes, the uh, triangles that were oriented vertically would be judged better. And along the horizontal axis, the ones that were oriented horizontally would be judged better and so forth also along the uh, diagonals. And here's what we found. So what we're plotting here is. Each of these is a polar plot of how high the ratings were for the triangle whose center was at that position and that was pointing in the direction that's given by these, uh, these uh, uh, angles here. So the one, the T, is top and bottom, left and right, top right, top left, and so forth. So the first thing you know, have to realize is that the area inside each one of these curves is the overall positional bias, how much they like that position independent of orientation or across all orientations. And what we find is what we found before. The center is the best position. There's a bias towards things along these, uh, these bisectors so that these guys here have the smallest area. The other thing you notice is if there were no orientational bias, it would be cir they would be circles, OK, and they're not. So this is showing that, in fact, there's a uh, bias toward the horizontal and vertical directions. And we're actually now replicating that with a rectangle that's been tilted 45 degrees to make sure that it's the parallelism with the sides rather than gravitational, horizontal, vertical, although it could be both. Um, and the third thing, though, is to notice is that we are getting these sort of elongations of these things. That is, 
say in this in this case that the uh, along the um, horizontal axis of symmetry that in fact the horizontal directions of pointing are in fact um, uh, judged to be uh, better or a better fit to the rectangle. Oh, I think this is just what I was just, I was supposed to be pressing this when I told you. <laughs> I'm pointing out the things I just told you. And you can actually see the elongation along the axes most clearly with, uh, in the corners here because the actual shape of these things changes fairly dramatically. Um, and we did another experiment, this is, uh, but it's the, the data are plotted in the same way. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. To look at uh, biases toward up, down, left, and right. And you find biases toward upward pointing triangles down at the bottom, but downward pointing triangles up at the top. And uh, you find rightward bias, uh, rightward bias on the left side, but you find a slight leftward bias on the right side. So this is an inward bias. This is the inward bias with, uh, in, in this particular experiment that I think corresponds to the inward bias that we saw in the aesthetic. So people are not being asked for an aesthetic judgment here, right? They're just asking, being asked for how well does this dot fit or this triangle fit in this frame. And I'll come back to what the relationship between those two things is because where I think we're going to find the analogy for that is in the color study, which is what I'm uh, coming to uh, next. But we also started to look at what happens if you add a second dot. How does it affect these ratings? And it's pretty interesting. So we get uh, ratings for the single dot, but also ratings for a second dot. The one that flashes is the one that people are supposed to rate. So there's either an empty rectangle or there's a rectangle with one context dot in it. The other dot comes up and flashes, and you're supposed to rate how well that dot fits within that configuration, that gestalt. Um, and what we find is interesting because, in fact, when you put a second dot in, everything changes. That is to say, so here are the data for the single dot sort of displayed the way that I showed you before. The center's the best position, the horizontal and vertical axes, and so forth. Um, but what happens when we have uh, another dot in there? I'll just give a couple of examples. So here's the context dot is the one that's shown in yellow, all right? And then notice that no longer is it the case that the center dot is the best one. The ones that, are, that fit the best when there's a context dot there are the ones that are symmetric with respect to the vertical and horizontal axis, and also the one that's centrically, as it's called, symmetric uh, with respect to the center. So the center itself isn't judged that uh, a good place, but the thing that's symmetric with respect to the center is, in fact. Um, and you also find elevated ratings along the things, positions that are aligned with along these uh, distinguished axes. Um, and just to show you that this isn't uh, the only, oh, this is the data. Actually, the single dot ratings matter almost not at all. You can predict almost everything about these data without knowing what the rating is for that particular location by itself. And this just shows another case where now there's the context dot. And what pops, see what popped over here with these kind of, that's the most dramatic one because those are the worst positions normally. What this pops are, in fact, these corner positions, which are, are relatively good by themselves. But again, the way you can predict a lot of the variance here uh, by knowing these relational, these kinds of relational variables. So the final project I want to mention is the color composition experiments. And um, this is work that was done uh, by Karen Schloss and myself. And the target really, what we were interested in was, uh, or the thing I was most interested in, which I'm going to tell you about anyway, is people's uh, aesthetic responses to pairs of colors, to color composition. How well do colors go together? What kinds of color combinations do people like? Um, and it's part of a much larger project where we bring in uh, a number of people and pay them to do an awful lot of different tasks. So not just, you know, um, what individual colors do you like, but what individual colors do you like in different contexts for a t-shirt or a wall color or whatever. We want to see whether the people's preferences, uh, in fact, um, ac across different objects are relatively stable or not. 
We get them to give preferences of color combinations, measurements of what's called color harmony. That's going to turn out to be important. Lots of colorimetric ratings, like how red or green or blue or yellow is this, et cetera, et cetera. We also get them to give us personality measures. We measure the big five personality scale for reasons that will become evident at the very end. I'm showing you data from only a few subjects. We show them colors on a CRT screen, and we give them a a uh, topic to make a rating on a, on a line. They just make a line where it falls from, say, how much do you like it, not at all, to very much, or whatever the dimension is we're having them rate. And um, the colors that we've used, we've used a particular set of 37 colors um, where we've got the so-called the four primaries, red, green, blue, and yellow with their angle bisectors, orange, purple, cyan, and chartreuse, OK? And we have uh, four different combinations of saturations and brightnesses. So this is the saturated ring that you're looking at here. There's the, the light ring. This is within, embedded within color space, for those of you who know what a color space is. Um, we have ones at the same, at medium saturation, at the same lightness level as the saturated ones, and a set at the dark plus the grays. That's our 37 colors. And the power of this experiment is that we have the same subjects doing all of these tasks with the very same colors so that we can look and find out, you know, what is it that matters in trying to predict whatever it is we're trying to predict, the Palmer Lab 37. So let's take a look at the hue preferences that we get. So here we're looking at average preference ratings um, across uh, hues. So red, orange, yellow, the chartreuse. They look the same on this projector for some reason, but or almost the same. Uh, this is chartreuse, green, cyan, blue, and purple. And uh, this is what we find. And remember that this is a cyclic dimension, right? So it all repeats here. Um, and it's a pretty regular function. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that it's almost the same preference function that you find with babies. If you take you know, 10 week old kids and you put them uh, in a situation where they can look at this color or they can look at that color and you measure how long they spend looking at the colors, you find a function that looks almost the same as this. Uh, I don't know what to make of that. I, haven't, I would like to study this sort of thing cross-culturally to find out whether there's something universal about it. I suspect not, but the baby data are kind of interesting. Um, and in fact, you can predict a good deal of the variance here. I'm not going to—I I believe it less in that than I did when I made this uh, made this up. Um, so what happens when you break this down by these these four different uh, pieces? Here are the uh, saturated colors, pretty much the same function, pretty much the same function for the medium saturation and for the light ones. Uh, the only one that's radically different is the dark ones, and the reason that it's different primarily is that dark yellow and dark orange are, are very much not preferred. And those are these colors right here. I don't know whether you can see them or not, but they're sort of brown, kind of poopy brown and pussy brown, uh, which may, in fact, be why it is that they're not generally uh, liked. Is that, is that the uh, official Crayola color? <laughs> Yeah, actually, I should go look, see what Crayola colors they are closest to. Have you been to that website? There's, a, there's an historical site for Crayola crayons that gives you all the names of all the colors that they've looked at, that the, the names of the different colors that they've used. Um, now, those are the average data, so I just want to show you how much individual difference there is underlying this. So these are the data for uh, some subset of our 27 subjects, and you can see that it's very noisy data. So it's a nice average, but that doesn't mean that, that, um, that that's actually capturing very much of the individual variation. But I'll get back to the individual variation business. Because where I want to go is with this color combination thing, so what happens if we present a color on a colored background now and ask them how much they like that combination of colors together. Um, and this is what we find. So what we've plotted here is that sort of that same function that I showed you before, but now we've got it with different background colors. So these are the background colors. These are the figural colors, the small square in the middle. And although it it's, looks kind of messy, it's actually very orderly. 
Because what happens is that you find, for example, purples, they like best on a purple background, next best on a blue, blue background, then a cyan background, and so forth. Blue, they like best on a blue background, OK? So they like colors, combinations, where the hue is the same, but the brightness or the saturation is different. And in fact, if you, um, if you then shift these curves so that they line up uh, with the figural color, cover, color in the center um, at zero. What is this? Oh, I forgot I had this. OK, so this is just letting you know that if you're trying to predict how much people like a pair of colors from how much they like the two colors individually, you can't do very well. OK, 20% of the variance, uh, multiple R of about 0.4 is the best you can do. Um, and that's not terribly good. So um, what we think is going on, in fact, we had people also make ra ra ratings of how harmonious pairs of colors were. And we said what that means is these are colors that go, to go, that go well together. I don't mean whether you like them or not. It's like in music, people would agree that Mozart is harmonious, Stravinsky is more dissonant. I might like dissonant music, you might like harmonious music, but we could both agree that Mozart is harmonious and Stravinsky is dissonant, relatively speaking. Okay, so we give them a little talk like that, and then we ask them to make these color harmony ratings, and part of the reason is that color harmony is actually very important in art theory. And in fact, uh, in, when you look in art theory, what you find is that um, typically, they talk about there being two different kinds of harmony, harmonies of analogous colors and, and harmonies of contrasted colors. So in terms of the kinds of plots that I showed you before, this would predict something like this, that um, as f the harmony of a for a given hue like that one would fall off as a function of similarity of hue, but then there would be some increase for at some point for these far away hues. Um, and you'll find that we don't actually find that. So I think I'm going to skip through this. This is just going to, because I'm running out of time here. Uh, I may have skipped the important slide. Well, actually, this has the data in it. OK, so, so here are the data for these, um, for these harmony uh, ratings. And this corresponds, the first number corresponds to um, the figural color and the second one to the background color. Uh, and basically what you find is that harmony is a function of similarity, of hue similarity. It falls off very uh, regularly and monotonically as the difference between the hues gets larger. Um, and in fact, when you uh, look at, I think I'm going to skip this too. Turns out that cool colors are more harmonious than warm colors. Um, there's the uh, harmony data, and there are the actual judge similarity data for the same subjects for the same colors. And here are the preference data. So what you find is that people do, in fact, prefer harmonious uh, color combinations, by and large. But the differences are not as great as the differences in harmony or similarity are. And the reason is that people differ a good deal in terms of how much they like harmonious combinations. So when you add harmony to uh, try to predict the, uh, how much people are going to like a pair of, com of, of colors, this is like averaging over everybody, you find out that it helps a lot. So instead of 20% of the variance, we can now get like over 70% of the variance by adding harmony. It's much more important than anything else that we've found. Um, I'm going to skip this. There is something about contrastive colors that we found, but it's not harmony. It's that a color, typically, particularly warm colors, look better on cool backgrounds than they do on warm backgrounds. But I haven't really got time to go through that. So, although maybe it's going to make me <laughs> take time. This is just showing you that the warm colors are systematically preferred on the cool background, and that the cool colors are systematically preferred on the warm background. Here, people are just judging how much they like the individual color in the center. They're not saying any, they're not making any judgments of harmony or anything else. It's just how much they like those um, particular, how much they like that color on that background against that background. And you even get reversals. So on the warm background, they like 
uh, blue much better than yellow on the blue background. They like uh, yellow much better than they do blue. Anyway, where I'm trying to get to is, no, sorry. I talk too much. Uh, OK. So where we're trying to get to is this relationship between harmony and preference. And what happens is, if you actually look, there's a lot of variability across people in terms of how much they like harmonious combinations. Some people like harmonious combinations a lot. My mother did. You know, her whole, her whole lower floor of the house was all done in beiges. Everything was beige and brown and, and tan. Uh, some people, you know, like uh, highly contrastive uh, non-harmonious combinations. So what we did was we looked at the correlation for each person, each of our subjects. We looked at the correlation between their preference ratings and their harmony ratings. And those varied from uh, slightly negative to very positive, from a correlation of like, you know, minus 0.1 up to about positive 0.8. And then we looked at that correlation and found out whether it was related to any of the personality variables that are uh, studied in this big five personality uh, index. And what we found was actually some pretty strong relationships. In particular, you find that people who like harmonious color combinations tend to be somewhat introverted and not very open. And the people who are extroverted and open tend to either dislike or not uh, be as fond of uh, harmonious color combinations. So this is where I'm going to link it back to the spatial thing. This is, this is the way, the sort of big picture, the way that I think that um, this stuff, this story that I'm trying to tell goes. That for an aesthetic domain, there are lots of variables that matter. Some of them are simple things. Uh, that we can uh, just you know, measure straight off just by, you know, I know where the center is. I can measure distance. That's all very easy. That turns out to be important for spatial composition. Uh, sometimes there are complicated things. Like, in fact, there may be stuff like balance, biases towards things being bal balanced and so forth. Um, and, but these biases, in fact, have an enormous amount of individual variation in them in the sense that different people have different preferences for things that are, say, balanced or colors that are harmonious. Uh, in terms of the spatial stuff, you know, the things with the frame, that there are these, there are these positions like the very center of the frame that fits well uh, along these axes of uh, symmetry and so forth. Some people are going to like that, and some people aren't going to like that. And we already found that for the color stuff. That, that, and there seem to be relationships to um, personality variables. We actually think one of the things we're going to do next is to get our color subjects back in where we've got all this information. And we're going to have them start doing the spatial tasks, where we already know sort of what the good fitting positions are. And we can find out, do they like things better when they're positioned in the good places or not? And the hope is that the same people who like the harmonious color combinations are going to be the people who like things to be positioned in the well-fitting spatial positions, that there's some kind of an internal consistency to people, that they have some sort of an aesthetic personality, if you will, um, in which they either like things that fit, that go together, that follow these, these biases, or things that don't, where there's more or different degrees of tension in the spatial composition or the color composition. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that we're going to be doing soon. And I, this is, I just, I'm going to skip all this stuff. I just want to get to the slide where we thank our um, sponsor for this research, the well-known funding agency. Whoops, there it was. Amy's Frozen Foods. How many people know Amy's Frozen Foods? Good stuff. Yeah, it turns out Karen Schloss's uncle works for Amy's Frozen Foods. And since we can't get any funding for this project, he was nice enough to donate several hundred coupons for Amy's Frozen Foods. And we pay our subjects in those coupons. So thank you very much for listening. And I'd be happy to uh, take questions.
took a little bit of a shot at a perceptual explanation. Uh, are you willing to take any kind of a shot at why, like so many babies, like blue? Or no, I haven't got a clue. If you look, actually, so you can you can look at baby preferences by measuring how long they. You can do the same thing with monkeys. Um, and macaque monkeys have almost identical color vision systems to uh, ours, and their preference function actually is a monotonic, almost linear function of wavelength from uh, yeah, low at the red end and high at the blue end. I don't know. I mean, hard to say. I don't know of any sort of, I mean, you can make up sort of um, ecological stories about, uh, you know, staying away from the poo-poo and the, you know, that, the stuff that people really don't like and maybe the stuff that's blue like water and, and green stuff, that, that's good stuff. I don't know. I haven't really got a clue. Yeah, in the back. Okay, go ahead. I don't know. That's a very new data, like about a week ago. So I don't know that we actually know whether that's significant or not. But um, yeah, we need to study that with. Uh, one of the things that was wrong with that, uh, not wrong with that, but needs to be worried about, is that we actually had texture on the wall behind it, and there was no texture on the, on the uh, ground plane or the table or whatever. Um, and that might have had something to do with why we got the kinds of results. You have to track that sort of stuff down and kind of figure out whether it matters or not, and I don't know the answer. Yeah? One of the points that seems to be coming out of this is that judgments of harmoniousness or you know, preference are stable over time. And yet my judgments about harmoniousness and music preferences that I have vary with time, emotional state, and all that kind of stuff. Do these also vary over time, or are they sort of fixed and constant and basic? Well, I'm sure they do. I mean, all this stuff changes over time. Um, it's hard enough to study it. You know, it is, this is sort of a snapshot approach, right? You take a person and you find out, you know, what it is they like at this moment in time. Uh, if we get to the point where we start doing the expertise stuff, then we'll presumably be getting people who are a little further along the curve. There's actually in the 1970s. This, this is one topic within aesthetics that actually a fair amount of work was done. In the, in the, say, 50s to 70s, Daniel Berlein did some really nice work on the dynamics of aesthetic preference. And uh, so basically what happens is as you get exposed to something uh, uh, more and more, I mean, if it's, if it's not very complex, then you like it less and less and less. It because it becomes more and more and more boring. But um, if it's maybe slightly too complex, there's sort of a curvilinear relationship between these things. So that um, if it's a slightly too complex, that you may actually like it more and more as you see it, um, because it's kind of bringing it into your optimal range. Um, but there, yeah, there are changes over time. And I can't say anything about that from the data that I've got. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, so we have uh, in that 20 subjects, we have like, uh, I think it's 13 women and, and, and seven men. Uh, we're going to study that, but we don't have enough uh, subjects. My memory of the color work is that men uh, actually prefer saturated, the saturated colors to the others, whereas women don't. Um, and I think that dip down the, in the brown range doesn't show up for the men nearly as strongly as it does for the women. But I, I don't know whether that's real or just, you know, we only have, there's only six guys in, the, in that uh, data set. But yeah, we, we're going to study that when we get enough, a balanced uh, sample. Yeah. Well, not really. Okay, there's a, there is one bump. Um, we did find that for blue and yellow, 
Let me see if I can find the actual curve here. So I think for yellow, this is yellow here, there's some hint of a bump at blue. I mean, it's not a big bump. I mean, I know it's probably not significant. Pardon me? Uh, OK, well, yellow and purple. I mean, there's a question about you know, what exactly is, is complementary. It depends on the particular yellow and the particular blue or purple. Um, but, but generally speaking, there isn't really any kind of bump that comes up. The thing I skipped over was I think that, that what the color theorists were talking about when they talked about these people's uh, the harmony of contrastive colors, I think he was talking about this effect that we found, which is that it's not that highly contrastive colors are harmonious with their complements. It's that that color by itself, that color looks better on that other colored background than if it's on something that's similar. So there's really, it's like they've taken two different things, one of which is sort of real intuitive harmony that they really kind of go together uh, and, and, and tried to force into that this thing about colors looking better on contrasted backgrounds. Um, we're actually looking at in natural images that have been segmented into objects, and we're trying to we're looking at um, the co-occurrence frequencies of different colors. And what you do is you find that uh, similar colors go together, not surprisingly, uh, within objects. You're much more likely to find similar colors within objects than between objects, and that that might be part of you know why where these. Um, this harmoniousness idea comes from, that they really do go together. They go together when you look at, if you segment the world in terms of objects, that those colors that are similar to each other, particularly similar in hue, tend to co-occur with each other within that object. And maybe that's where this comes from. Yeah? Uh, I noticed there was a slight asymmetry in the position preference um, data. Uh, in what? In which? which? Yeah, I, the, uh, you mean with a dot or you mean with a, rect with a, a triangle? Um, both, actually. The, the triangle is very obvious, actually. Uh-huh. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, there's a, I think that with the triangle, I think there's a rightward bias. I mean, there's an upward bias and there's a rightward bias. Neither of them are as big as the inward bias. Um, but if you want to predict those data, you need to be able you need to know whether it's pointing up versus down, left versus right, as well as in versus out. If there weren't any um, rightward bias, then you know, the left and right sides would be completely symmetrical. But if there is a lateral bias, it's toward the right rather than toward the left. In this culture, with the sort of you know, groups of subjects that we look at. Do you think this has anything to do with reading Yeah. I think it probably has something to do with handedness, and it probably has something to do with reading direction. But uh, you know, it's not something that I've studied. People who have looked at some of those kinds of things have found relationships to handedness and hemispheric laterality, uh, also to um, uh, reading direction. But I have no, I have no, nothing more to say about that. OK, thank you very much.